Okay, hi everybody. So I'm Gary Van Um I'll be uh, giving, uh, talking to you. Um, I'll be providing the lecture for module nine, uh, which is on in, um, environmental uh, genomics and uh, lateral gene transfer. Um, but a little bit about myself. So I am the uh, chief of the bioinformatics section at the National Microbiology Laboratory, which is part of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, I was um, hired in 2005 to establish the bioinformatics lab at the National Microbiology Laboratory. My arrival coincided with the acquisition of uh, our first high throughput sequencer. That was a 454 sequencer and um actually it's one of the it was the first installation of a high throughput sequencer in Canada and I knew that this was going to probably be pretty important and will impact a lot of the, the work that I was um, expected to do that has turned out to be true um so back then Genomic epidemiology of infectious diseases didn't even really exist, and so there. Um, so basically, it's been like about a seventeen-year process of, of of building up genomic epidemiology within the the National Microbiology Lab and more broadly. And my stated career objective is to deploy genomic epidemiology as broadly as possible across Canada and also um, globally for public health applications. And and training is a very big component of deploying genomic epidemiology capacity. And so I am just thrilled to be here to, um, uh, to be talking to such a large group of people, uh, our next generation of scientists who are, are interested in the field of genomic epidemiology for infectious diseases. I'd just like to remind everybody that the lecture is being distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. So that allows you to copy, distribute, and transmit the work and to adapt the work so long as you attribute the work to the authors. Um, and if you do alter, transform, or build upon this work and you redistribute it, you must redistribute it under the same Attribution Share Alike license. Okay. So here's our module on nine, Mobile Genetic Elements and Environmental Microbiome, um, which I'll be presenting to you on behalf of Professor Rob Pico, who's a longtime collaborator of mine. Um, but unfortunately, Rob couldn't be here today to give the lecture. Hold on. Um, so, um, which is a shame because he is very talented um, public speaker and uh, full of all sorts of wisdom that I lack. So, uh, but fortunately I have his acolyte, Finley McGuire is stand, stand, on standby here to help me along if I stumble. And we have a, um, quite a bit of content and not a lot of time to get through it. So I'm gonna just dive right in. Here are our learning objectives. So by the end of this lecture, Hopefully, you will understand how environmental sequencing differs from clinical genomic sequencing, understand how environmental samples are used for pathogen surveillance, know the different types of mobile genetic elements that mediate horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer, understand the impact of horizontal gene transfer on the analysis of the microbiome, I'll hand on um, regular clinical genomes, and then to know the main bioinformatics tools that are used for pathogen detection and characterization. So part one wanted to just go and the, so at this point this is largely review for you but i wanted to go over one more time on clinical sequencing versus environmental sequencing and draw out some of the important consequences of the of that difference and how we um tackle the anal uh the analysis of environmental samples especially in the context of antimicrobial resistance um and lateral gene transfer okay so let's start off with a simple example. So, and that's for SARS-CoV-2. And, and, and Dr. Simpson has already given us a, an excellent lecture describing how this is performed, but just to just for your review, the way that it works is we get a clinical specimen um, through like a nasopharyngeal swab that is preserved and transferred to a lab. The um, RNA is extracted, converted to cDNA, sent through a sequencer, and that pumps out the genomic sequence information, and then we use that to perform 
our analysis. In, for environmental sequencing and for and in the context of SARS-CoV-2, this is um, wastewater sequencing. So what happens is, well, people shed the virus um, through feces. Um, and in that is collected at uh, wastewater um, treatment facilities, and it's sampled there. So it's sampled as a collection of viruses from a community of people who are contributing virus um, uh, through uh, through wastewater. And so that that sample is performed. The, the analysis is performed the same way. There's a, well, I mean, there's a little bit of work. It's a different type of sample. You have to concentrate it. Etc. But ultimately, you're extracting that nucleic acid, that, that nucleic material, RNA, um, from that community um, of viruses. And uh, well, and so I show at the top, you send it through for RT-PCR, and then that will gi gives you insight on um, the those different how much viral load exists in those communities. It's a nice and quick way to be able to see if there may be um, uh, emergence of a highly, highly transmissible variant who's increase in the viral load. Or, uh, and then it's all the second part is diverted out for whole genome sequencing. Okay. Okay, so we know how the sequencing is performed for SARS CoV 2 um, through the use of these pools of these um, primers that are designed to tile across the genome, the amplicons um, that are generated from that PC, from those PCR reactions are sent into the sequencer and um, the reads that come out of the sequencer are mapped to a reference genome. So you see that here on the right. And then you look for mutations in the reads relative to the reference. And those uh, col the collection of variants, uh, the collection of mutations are used to assign the um, that genome sequence to a given lineage, and for additional types of analysis. When you're doing the environmental sequencing, it's a metagenomic approach. So you have a collection of genomes. And in this toy example, I have two genomes of one lineage, pink lineage. And one link and and one genome of the blue lineage, and the and the amplicons will um, tile across these genomes. The genomes themselves may be fragmented, um, so you may not get perfect coverage. Uh, certainly, will not get perfect coverage across all of the genomes. You get fragments of those of 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 coverage um, across the collection of genomes, but you take those. Um, amplicons, you run those through the sequencer, you map them to the reference, but now you're getting this collection of different mutations that occur in different proportions. So in this example, we can see a C to G mutation in the pink lineage. It's wild type for the blue lineage and exists in a, a two to one ratio. Um, and in this example here, we see a C um, versus a G reference. So the pink have the reference, the G, um, mutation, the, the blue minor circulating lineage has a C in that position. Here it has the T, which is wild type, and the C is, for, um, is from, the, um, from the pink lineage. But again, these exist in this two to one proportion. And so we can use that information um, to help us try to disentangle what exists in there. There's not much disentangling going on though, just because the there's the data is so fragmentary. Um, and typically of low or excuse me, high CT value or low viral load. So uh, but there's two ways to attack the problem. One is to generate a consensus sequence in the same way that we generate a consensus sequence from the uh, from clinical genome sequencing, we see that here at the top arrow here, we captured those mutations, and we can assign it to a lineage, and then we do that, you know, um, thousands of times, 
or hundreds of times or however many times. And this allows us to get up. So remember, this is coming from, from wastewater surveillance, but it gives us essentially a distribution of the proportion of the lineages that are circulating within that community or aggregated nationally or however you want to do it. This is what we do here at the National Microbiology Laboratory is we, we take a look and see, well, what is circulating in wastewater at the national level? This is an actual plot of that. And the second um, method is to look um, below the consensus, so the subconsensus. And here, there's no presumption that you're going to get to try and infer different consensus sequences for the different lineages. But you can take a look at the different mutations that you found in there, and those may be indicative of a given lineage, um, or they must they might just be the types of mutations. And so, in, so in addition to monitoring lineages, we also monitor for mutations. Um, there are certain notorious mutations that have arisen, and well, it's a dynamic process; changes over time. But we want to look for those and see if those um, uh, mutations of interest are also um, increasing in prevalence, or if they, especially if they increase rapidly in prevalence, and that can give us a, a sense of uh, of what may be going on in, in in terms of whether that mutation or that collection of mutations may be associated with, for example, increased transmissibility um, or increased uh, immune evasiveness. Okay, there. Um, this is a, a link for you, just for your own reference, for the COVID-19 wastewater surveillance dashboard, the national dashboards. And this is coming from the RT-QPCR data that was made publicly available. Um, the genome sequence data is not really of the quality where we are comfortable making it available on a government dashboard. So it's at this point, it's basically just used internally, submitted to GSA for other people to look at if they want. Okay, the pipeline that we use for performing um, a lot of the wastewater genomic surveillance is called uh, Viral Recon. I'm not going to go into the details of this pipeline. Um, although, you know, given that you've seen the lecture from uh, from Jared Simpson, you will probably recognize that there are a lot of subcomponents in the pipeline that are very similar, things like um, the, the variant callers, um, SNPF to see what the uh, functional effect of a variant might be, et cetera, pangolin assignment here, next plate assignment, et cetera. All right. So, so, so that's um, uh, kind of like a simple example of environmental sequencing um, as applies to SARS-CoV-2. Actually, for the rest of the lecture, I want to focus more on bacteria, and um, the although the, but the the concept essentially is the same, but there are some some notable differences. One notable difference is when you're sequencing um, in a, uh, a bacteria in a clinical context, you are typically culturing the that organism, the bacterium, um, and uh, selecting an isolate, sequencing the isolate, and then you'll get the whole genome sequence for that isolate, which includes all of the, the main chromosome, and it also can include things like plasmids and other extra chromosomal elements. And um, and so and it's not always the same like it is with SARS-CoV-2. Or you're looking for differences in mutations. There's actually difference in gene content, um, even well, you know, within um, certainly within a within a species, um, more or less depending on which species you're looking at. But also even within um, lineages that are circulating, for example, within an outbreak. Uh, so there's a little bit of variability, but you capture all of that variability in that when you get that whole genome sequence. When you're doing environmental sequencing, for example, if you're sequencing in a farm or or, or, um, uh, or some other habitat, you are ex the environmental sampling is going to give you a collection of microorganisms, um, and there can be substantial diversity in there. You but the uh, so you extract the um, the nucleic acid content from that community of microorganisms, 
using a metagenomic approach. And so you do the, the, the sequencing there. But in this case, you're, there's no guarantee. And it's very likely the case that you're not going to be able to generate a, to, to regenerate an entire genome for even for, even for a, a given bacterium, um, let alone for all of the, bact the bacteria, the diverse bacteria that may exist in that sample. And so that is a bit of a problem. We're just sampling bits of it. And um, the problem is becomes especially um, important when we are trying to monitor and, for, for example, perform surveillance of antimicrobial resistance and lateral gene transfer. And so in this example here that I'm showing you at the bottom, we have a horizontal gene transfer region. So this is a feature of, uh, so assume that this is, this is a section of the genome that is mobile, um, and it contains these antimicrobial resistance elements, so one to A. Um, but because of the random sampling and partial sampling that we're doing for this one segment of this one genome in this community of genomes, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to sample all of the antimicrobial resistance that, that is contained within that genome for that organism. Um, and we, even if we do, we're likely only um, able to grab part of that, um, uh, like a fragment of that gene. Uh, and um, Dr. MacArthur talked at length about some of the difficulties in doing, um, trying to assign um, antimicrobial resistance determinants from metagenomic data. Um, and so, so these are some of the, so these are problems here and just on, on the, what that, that relate to, to the uh, detection of antimicrobial resistance genes. But also, it doesn't give you information about the flanking sequence that is additionally important, because it's typically this combination of things that we're interested in looking at, not just the antimicrobial resistance, but, um, but also whether it is harbored by a mobile genetic element. So you don't get the, you really, you don't really get all of that context in the same way that you get it from um, a clinical sequence. And, and, so, and so this is, is a, quite a bit of a problem. Unfortunately, the problem that we can't really avoid because of the importance of, uh, the fundamental importance of, of environmental sampling in being able to identify what is the, the source and the um, patterns of transmission of antimicrobial resistance along the farm to fork continuum. Okay, so so we're moving on here to, um, to the part on lateral gene transfer. Um, okay, and some of the problems that we have with that. So, um, so we're talking about genes that move here. And then, so this has, has been um, alluded to in prior lectures, but the problem um, stated briefly here is that we have um, this assumed method of inheritance that is captured in a phylogenetic tree, that's the vertical inheritance, descent with modification. So, uh, so the, the genes and the, the content here is uh, acquiring the diversity through this, um, uh, uh, through uh, through this vertical descent with modification type of paradigm here. But when you have recombination and lateral gene transfer, this violates this assumption that we use in phylogenies of having this um, bifurcating tree structure here. So a gene that may exist in one part of the tree, one sub um, uh, clade of a, of a given community of organisms can be transferred into another subclade. Um, and so this is a violation of this bifurcating tree structure. The, the phylogenetic tree on its own is insufficient for us to be able to capture um, and um, investigate these types of, of recombination and, and lateral gene transfer events. So how do we, you know, so we need a method to be able to, to track that, but also this is, uh, you know, it's a, 
well, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting problem that we need to um, that that has lots of of, of uh, important downstream implications. So, what are we talking about with lateral gene transfer? Um, it's essentially it's a change of address. So, and there's three from one organism to another, and this can occur in three ways. So, one is transduction. That's where you have a bacteriophage that can infect a host cell. And normally, so it can go through these processes called um, phage lysogeny, where it can integrate itself into the genome, or it can be an analytic phage where it's um, replicating um, independently, but it can, um, and, and normally what will happen is the phage will just um, encapsulate its own genomic material and will just transmit its own genomic material. But on occasion, you can have these aberrations that can occur where the phage will uptake, uh, instead of uptaking its own DNA, it will uptake some of the bacterial DNA instead. That's called generalized transduction. And then it can, and so the, 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 the phage progeny is still viable, but it contains the wrong DNA and it can, so when it, and when it, it releases from the donor cell, it can go into the recipient cell and inject that um, bacterial DNA, which is up, again, is uptaken by um, the, the bacteria, either in chromosome or in a plasmid. And then there's also um, specialized transduction where the, through a combination, you can, a part of the phage genome is replaced with, a, with bacterial DNA, and that gets encapsulated inside the phage. Um, sometimes it's, it makes the phage is not transmissible, but you can have help a phage along that can provide the additional functionality that's missing by that phage and allow it to be able to transmit and to infect the recipient cell. The second method is conjugation. And so, and this is, most people have, I think, assume are pretty familiar with conjugation. So this is sexual transmission method that requires contact between the donor and the recipient cell. Um, and the, um, uh, the letter gene transfer is mediated typically by a plasmid that has the functionality to be able to replicate itself, to partition itself, and to be able to create the um, well, the pilus or other mechanisms to allow for the transmission of cytoplasmic transmission of its content from the donor into the recipient. The last uh, type of, of lateral gene transfer occurs through transformation, where a uh, dead bacterium releases its DNA out into the environment, and certain bacteria, uh, not all of them, but certain bacteria, especially if they are in a certain uh, in a in a phase of their life cycle, can uptake called it can become what's called competent, which means that they can uptake that DNA and through a process of recombination may integrate it into its own genome. Okay. So why is it so important? Um Lateral gene transfer is really important because the genes that are transferring are typically not the ones that are required for viability, but um, those are the ones that are typically harbored just in the, in the main chromosome. But they're the ones that are important for providing a selective advantage in an environmental niche. Antimicrobial resistance is a really good example. So um, organisms that may exist distantly within the taxonomic tree can acquire that new functionality without having to evolve it through descent with modification. Essentially, you have a donor from, from a distant species that can say, here, take this um, DNA and uptake it. It has this selective advantage that may help you to be able to um, uh, give you a selective advantage to be able to thrive in a given ecolog uh, ecological niche. And so um, here's an example with this aminoglycoside resistance gene, BAES that is that has been identified um, as having um, a common origin because it has this conserved res, um, neighborhood of genes. So here's BAE5, and you can see that there's, there's it's not perfect, but there's a pretty well conserved neighborhood of genes um, in, uh, in that neighborhood in these three different species, Salmonella, Citrobacter, uh, E. coli, and Enterobacter. So, so all of these 
are recipients of this BAES gene um, without having to had to be able to evolve that resistance functionality on its own. Okay, so um, lateral gene transfer is implicated in the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Here is a good example of it. So this is an example of Yersinia pestis. Uh, two strains of Yersinia pestis, which is the causative agent of the plague, um, that contain these plasmids uh, that for two different antimicrobial resistance genes. So this one has um, doxycycline resistance genes. This one has streptomycin resistance genes. And the homology of the plasmid in of this plasmid is related to salmonella. So it's likely that this plasmid was acquired from salmonella. And this, this plasmid over here, its genes have, oh, have similarity so you shouldn't have said homology, but they have a high degree of similarity to genes that have been found in um, acidovorax. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, so, so, not just a problem that you can receive it from from one neighbor. You can receive it from multiple different neighbors from across the phylogeny or across the taxonomy, um, and that uh, so so that promiscuity um, is also a big problem. Salmonella and acidovorax are um, actually from different orders, I believe. So, or different classes, actually. So the, the salmonella is a, um, is it a beta proteobacteria? And acidovorax is a gamma proteobacteria, I believe. So they belong to the same phylum, which is the proteobacteria, but they belong to different classes. And so that is a pretty long ways away. And so the, for, for the ability to be able to transmit these genes across that wide species gap is quite concerning. And so it makes it very, because it makes a, it's very difficult to be able to, to, to control the acquisition of antimicrobial resistance. Okay. So, all right, so we discussed mobile um, genetic elements in, in, a, in a kind of a general way, but a mobile genetic is, is basically any type of DNA that can move around within the genome. We talked about the, you know, uh, transduction and um, <laughs> conjugation, et cetera, as those main mechanisms, but there is also a, a different, um, different types of, well, they're called replicons, right? But these are the different types of, of mobile genetic elements, and they can include plasmids, transposons, bacteriophage elements, genomic islands, there's more. Um, and um, when you compile all of the mobile genet genetic elements that are um, harbored within a genome, that's referred to as the mobile ome. I'm not, I don't go, I'm not going to go through and profile all of the characteristics of these different mobile genetic elements but I do provide them to you at the end of the lecture in the additional slide section, and you will refer to them in the practical, but I'm not going to cover them here. Okay, so detecting recombination is important um, because it can help us to identify the major modes and vectors of transmission. So what I mean by that is like which genes are being shared, how are they being shared, who are they being shared with, and where is that happening? And like which, you know, like which types of environments, like in the, in the hospital or in the community? And why is this important? It's because we can use this information to identify ri the risk factors. So it's important for risk assessments, like which genes are being mobilized, which are not. Um, and also that is gives us you know, mechanisms to be able to, um, to, prioritize our interventions to help to try to minimize the accumulation of antimicrobial resistance. But it is not any, it's not easy. Finding evidence for a combination in lateral gene transfer is not easy at all. Very difficult problem. And we're kind of in early stages. And maybe I'll just give you the punchline. There, we're not going to get to the point here when you say that it's a solved problem and you just use this bioinformatics by point, okay? But we are making some headway. Anyway, here are some of the clues that we have to uh, try to um, identify lateral gene transfer. So one is that we can find genes that have um, phylo phylogenetic trees that don't make a lot of sense um, in 
uh, at, at different contextual level. So in this is an example here where we have a species tree and we have the, um, a, a cladogram showing us the species tree on the left. And then we have a cladogram showing the gene tree and they're different. How are they different? If you take a look at nodes five and six, you'll see that the most recent common ancestor of five and six is, um, an, has a, is uh, well, there's a most, the, the most recent ancestor from five to the ancestor five and six is um, harbors node four, okay? But in the gene tree, um, five, the most recent common ancestor of five and six here is, oh, this is a rooted tree, is, is um, uh, has, well, the common ancestor of five and six has a common ancestor with, um, with gene one rather than gene four, right? So these gene, these two trees have different topologies even though they're coming from the same species. You're just looking at a single gene, right? So they're different. What is going on there? Why is this happening? It could be because of lateral gene transfer. Um, as these mobile elements evolve in these different species, which may have different uh, GC content and different uh, codon biases over, over time, they will have different uh, sequence compositions. And if one gets um, transferred, a recipient or a donor transfers its divergent composition of DNA into a um, into a recipient, it may appear um, like you see here was a as a different in for example like GC, GC content or in codon bias. Right? So you can look for these stretches of um, differential uh, motifs. Right, um, and uh, that may be evidence of of, a, of lateral gene transfer. Okay, uh, a third one is unex unexpected sequence similarity between genomes. So when you get lateral gene transfer, essentially what's happening is you're inserting a piece of DNA from the recipient into from the donor into the recipient. So in this example here on the left, we have our donor cell in blue squares. We have the DNA of the recipient cell here in these red um, spheres. And then the transform cell has places a piece of the donor cell in between the, um, the genes of the, of, the, uh, of the recipient. In homologous recombination, it's not an insertion, it's a replacement. So you are replacing one gene with another one. And so if you have two genes that are similar, but slightly divergent, um, then uh, that, um, but, but um, in one genome, but not in the other genome, that may, that may be evidence of homologous recombination. So in this example, this green sphere here has replaced this red sphere here, although, and these ones, the flanking genes here um, re remain the same as the recipient cell. So we take a look at this and say, hey, you know, the ancestor here looked like this, right? This descendant looks like this. This green sphere doesn't, you know, didn't come from the ancestor. It must've come from somewhere else. All right. So another clue is this kind of guilt by association. So if, they, if, you're, if the gene that you're interested in um, is localized to other genes that have uh, that are implicated in mobile genetic elements, then that is a good clue that you have a mobile genetic element, right? So here we have the we have uh, the um, uh, Tet M gene here. It's an accessory gene, but it's flanked by these genes for conjugative transfer, genes for recision, um, excision agents, and integrases. So this kind of gives us the sense that this mold, that this um, uh, antimicrobial resistance gene may have been transferred and is mobilizable because of its uh, because it's harbored within a larger um, segment of genes that have the um, characteristics of of mobile genetic elements. All right. Okay. So how do we find these things? So we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the programs that we can use to try and find mobile genetic elements. So, and but and how do these programs work? Well, they work with these kind of general clues, right? So, because 
MGs bounce around a lot, they, a lot, they can look foreign relative to the rest of the genome. We looked at that, right? So different nucleotide compositions. Some genes can be signatures for, um, for, for uh, um, mobile genetic elements. I mean, we looked at that, right? So replicases and plasmids, transposases, integrases, excisionases, and there's a whole bunch, right? Virulence factors um, and AMR genes, secretion system genes. These are all um, in indicators of uh, possible mobile genetic elements. And you can use, uh, so you can use this information of, of this contextual information you can also um, do some searches against your reference databases to see if the um, if the genetic element that you have is implicated in a previously described um, and um, recorded mobile genetic element using things like blast and diamond, or you can use things like mash. Okay, all right. So we we're not going to go. I'm not going to. We're not going to rehash um, RGI. This has already been covered, but RGI is a very good program, excellent program. I consider this to be first in class program for identifying antimicrobial resistance genes. Um, Mob Suite is a program, collection of programs that was actually was developed at the National Microbiology Laboratory um, by, uh, by James Robertson. Um, and so this is a program for working on trying to identify plasmids and to also help to characterize and um, to cluster plasmids. And so it's, a, so it's a suite of programs. One is mob cluster. So, and it, so it has an existing database that has a high quality reference plasmid database that has been clustered together, I think using MASH. But the focus is on gram negative enterics because this is uh, that's what we have access to. And, was, and in order to build that that reference plasmid database, they had to, the 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 isolates that they had to access to was from the um, from our enterics program, mostly Salmonella, I believe. But they did a lot of um, assembly, uh, including um, uh, hybrid assembly, so short read and long read assembly of of a large number of Salmonella genomes in order to be able to identify and assemble and annotate these high quality um, databases. But you can also cluster your own. Um, Set. So if you've done the same thing and you have a database of, of plasmid um, sequences, then you can use mob cluster to cluster them together into similar plasmids. Mob recon um, can help to find and classify the plasmids in your data sets. You also remember the, we're trying to find like remember the, when you do uh, an assembly, you're not going to get you can't guarantee that your entire plasma will be captured in a single context. So this will go and look for, um, well, we'll look for contigs that are circular and if it can find one, well, that's a plasma. In typically there's very, very rare um, that you're gonna be able to get like an entire circular chromosome, right? In a single contig, right? It's more likely that you'll be able to get a plasma, especially if you're using um, long read sequencing technologies like Oxford Nanopore. Nanopore. Look for the um, for the characteristic plasmid genes, like the relaxes or replicon genes. That makes it a candidate plasmid. And then you can also compare it to the high quality reference plasmid database that has been generated. So long as you're um, you're working with these gram negative enterics, you have a good chance of being able to find it. And then there's mob mob typer, which looks at the relaxes and other information to be able to try and figure out whether your plasmid falls into one of these two, three major classes: conjugative, conjugative, which means that it has all of the facilities to be able to replicate itself and to transfer itself into the um, to a recipient. All of those genes are located right on the plasmid. Uh, so the so the pilot formation, for example, um, and the mo mobilizable doesn't have the ability to transfer, it's, it's not fully self-transmissible, but if those genes exist on the main um, plasmid, then it can basically be mobilized, right? So if, if, if the, you still get the mate port formation, the, the formation and the pilot formation and that, and the, um, and the, the plasma can take it the rest of the way. And then there's non-mobilizable where it does, where it doesn't actually, so it can replicate and it can descend into a, um, into its, uh, into daughter, progeny genomes through vertical inheritance, but it is, um, may not be transmittable through lateral gene transfer. 
Okay, so genomic islands. Uh, as, as, and I also consider the so the island star group of programs is, uh, in my opinion, best in class. It is developed in uh, Professor Fiona Brinkman's lab and consists of a couple of different modules. Island Path is will look for the pattern, unusual patterns of nucleotide composition, uses hidden Markov models, and also looks for the presence of these smoking gun genes, such as mobility genes. Um, Island View will view predicted islands that have been previously predicted in um, large databases of genomes. Um, and so it will allow you to, to be able to, to view those. Uh, and if you have one and it will, it's predicted by Island Path, you can view it in Island View. It also will identify the AMR genes and virulence factors that may be contained inside of these genomic islands. And Island Compare, which compares the, the um, previously identified genomic islands across genomes here. Okay. Uh, Vibrant is a prophage finder um, and one of dozens of very good prophage finders, but it's the one that's being going to be used in one of the programs that uh, we're going to be profiling in, in the lab, so it's, it's worth spending a minute or two on it. Um, oops, it's, did I go too far? Right, so this is a program that uses a combination of, of protein similarity and um, uh, a neural network to be able to predict the viral content of a genome from environmental data. So uh, if you have a prophage in, in a genome, but you've sequenced it using a metagenomic approach, the Vibrant is a good program to be able to identify that. Um, for you. And so what it does is it uses these reference databases, which are databases of orthologous groups, genome families. So the CAG cofam is our either CAG orthologous gene families, PFAM is families as gene families, and the and uh, virus orthologous groups is another database that all provide hidden Markov models that can detect whether your gene is falls into one of these orthologous groups. Um, and so it will take that information, it will use that to annotate your, um, your assembled, your metagenomic assembled data and make it look, uh, and uh, assign it as a, as a possible candidate um, viral genome. And then it uses a bunch of these B scores, which are based on the annotations, feeds that into the neural network. Um, and that it generates the final prediction. So you have assembled metagenome protein scaffolds and nucleotide scaffolds. You'd be just assembling the data. And if it's if those scaffolds, those contexts are too small, it will remove it. In the second step, it goes through and, and annotates it with these hidden Markov models from KEG, PFAM, and VOG. And uh, so um, if what well, so we say too small means if there's not enough genes on that contig then it will remove them, it says these are likely not, not a viral contig. And then it takes the remaining ones, so they have, so they, they're composed largely of, of, of genes with viral, um, uh, viral associated genes, and uh, puts it through a neural network, but if the score is too low, it will remove those. So, and the ones that remain are the ones that are predicted to be viral in origin. And at the bottom here, you have this uh, PCA plot here that's showing you the, the, how well the uh, Vibrant does on predicting the, um, the viral content here. So uh, the green here are the ones that have been um, uh, assigned as virus, right? Uh, plasmid are in red and then bacterial are in archaean. So it's a pretty good discrimination. A bit of a mix here between the plasmid and the uh, and viral, but pretty good discrimination between 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 uh, chromosomes um, and uh, and viral uh, like bacterial chromosome um, contigs and viral contigs and okay for plasmids and and viruses. Uh, and if you oh, and just at the bottom of this listed here is a. Uh, uh, a prophase prediction comparison program. So it takes a look at about, I think it was maybe like a, a dozen different 
programs uh, and it will perform the predictions and allow you to compare the predictions um, if that's what you're into. Okay, proxy. So I couldn't help but insinuate some of my own content into Rob's um, talk here. And so, and because I wanted to be, to profile this with you in the, um, the lab section here, I just want to give you a brief introduction to proxy. Proxy developed in um, as, a, as a joint collaboration in my lab and the lab of uh, Professor Paul Stothard at the University of Alberta. Um, so this is a not for environmental genomes per se, designed more for full genomes, but, um, but it can be very useful. Um, but it will also take fragments of genomes. But the idea here is it's a genome assembly and annotation and visualization system. It's designed to be easy to use. You don't need to do have a lot of background understanding to be able to use it. And one of the reasons why we wanted to develop this is because um, there's because the barrier to generating bacterial genome sequences is very low. Any lab can now routinely generate oodles of bacterial genome sequence data where they sometimes lack, um, uh, where they find themselves lacking is in the expertise to be actually be able to assemble it and to be able to annotate it um, and uh, to be able to integrate different types of programs to be able to analyze um, and then visualize the the genomes that they generate. And so that's what proxy is for. So proxy will assemble your genomes from raw reads um, if you if that's what you want, but it will also accept um, assembled contigs and it will also assemb um, uh, uh, accept annotated contigs if that's what you want. Um, but uh, but the assembly, <laughs> process will, it'll assemble a genome in a fast way using a program called Skiza, and it uses that to generate these QC metrics. It will also uses, uh, uses MASH to assign the um, assembled genome sequence to its most likely species. So if it came from Listeria, it will say, this looks like I'm assigning this to Listeria, and then it will compare it to other assemblies for Listeria and say, well, how well did you do, right? So, and it's looking at these assembly metrics, like N50, L50, numbers of contigs, and also, you know, and length, right? So here, and it will place yours in context of the, um, of these other assemblies. And so that way you can use that to say, okay, well, this may, you know, this looks like a pretty good assembly, I'm pretty happy with what I have, and I can proceed now with my annotation and analysis. Um, and there's a there's so and so there's a, a couple more different metrics here that you can use. Although I'm not going to um, go into details of them, and we're not going to look at the assembly because in the lab section, just because of the time required to compute the assembly. So we're going to look at pre-assembled genomes. But I just wanted to let you know that that is available there for you. So it kind of reduces the barrier for you to be able to generate and analyze genome sequences. And then you have the, pro the main program here, which will render the annotations on your genome in a circular or a linear view. But the default is a circular view, where you get a track, this great uh, um, well, backbone here in the middle, and then you have these tracks that radiate concentrically out from the um, from that backbone, and that's where you can place annotations, and you can place annotations from different types of annotation programs. We have a bunch of different annotation programs here, um, and uh, and also the ability to upload your own annotations if you have them from from. Uh, from external programs that you may have used to analyze your data here. Now, the nice part about proxy is that you, the, the, that is extensible, which means it's very easy for us to add new programs to it. But, and the, so the programs here that were listed here are, well, the proxies in beta right now, the paper will come out in the summer um, but right now we kind of consider it to be in beta. So I have an initial list of programs here and these may evolve over time once we get some better programs. Some are really good, some are better. For example, BACTA will probably use that to replace PRACA since so BACTA is kind of like the considered to be the successor of PRACA. But, um, but one of the considerations for implementing these, um, uh, these annotation pipelines 
is the just how well constructed those pipelines are. Right. Some are so poorly constructed that the they're essentially uh, uninstallable or they're they they fail. Um, they're not very robust uh, and they um, uh, aren't maintained like they're abandoned. So there's a huge amount of of different programs that are available to use, but there's a small number of programs that are of the quality that allow you to be able to implement it into a system like this. Um, so, and I'll talk about that a little bit more just in, actually in the next couple of slides. Anyway, but I just wanted to wrap up here a little bit on this section here. So just a, uh, a summary on these, on um, some of the caveats here for these mobile genetic elements. So mobile genetic elements are highly mutable in the gene content order, they can change. That's why it's nice to be able to, to be able to view it in a genomic context as like a circular context. Yeah. Um, some databases are better for some organisms like the gram negative enterics, which is there's a whole lot of sequencing done, um, less so on others like gram positives. So the comparative methods um, may be better for some organisms than they are for others. Short read assembly tends to, um, tends to fail spectacularly for mobile genetic elements. Um, it's difficult to be able to get these, you know, the, these beautiful finished circular plasmids when you're using these short read technologies. Longer read technologies are help more helpful for for getting these larger. Um, uh, mobile genetic elements like plasmids. And predicting the boundaries of things like genomic islands and other lateral um, uh, or mobile genetic elements is also, is, is also a problem. I'll look at that in a second. How are we doing for time? We've got minutes. seven minutes left. Seven minutes, perfect. Okay, so I wanted to return a little bit to my rant about software. <laughs> um, about bioinformatics software development and its ability to be able to be implemented. And so you guys have kind of seen this a little bit before. So one, so, so if your program has a million de like very um, idiocratic, idiocratic and, and bespoke kind of um, dependencies, it can make it very hard to install and to maintain. And so there are these package managers like Conda that, uh, that will resolve the dependencies for you. So it's nice if you generate software, if you can generate it and put it into a Conda package. Also, um, there are these virtual environments like Docker. So Docker makes it easy for you to be able to run these packages inside of, a, say, like a high performance computing environment without requiring you to have um, uh, like root level privileges. Uh, but in order to be able to use it, Docker needs to be installed in your high performance computing system, which I don't think is the case um, for all, um, uh, for, for a lot of high performance computing environments. So I think Compute Canada, for example, doesn't um, permit Docker. Singularity is another type, is like simple, is like Docker, it's a virtual environment where you can install and run your programs. Um, but I think it is, it tries to, instead of trying to partition everything off into its own image like Docker does, it tries to integrate a little bit more with the host. Um, and um, also I think you can run stuff with sudo uh, without requiring um, sudo. I'm not an expert in all of the, these different um, like package managers. Um, and so the I'm, I'm not as familiar with the all the advantages and disadvantages I have to concede. Um, but um, uh, I'm sure that uh, the people, some people in the class are, and that our TAs are. So if there's, if you have um, a, in additional insight that you would like to be able to provide to the students on Conda or Docker Singularity, then I would uh, encourage you to add that to the Slack channel. Okay, and then um, implementation inside of a workflow execution manager like Nextflow is also is is important especially if you plan to if you want to have your program executed in a high performance computing environment and here's where we get to this um, program that Finley wrote called antimicrobial resistance emergent transmission ecologies or Irite for short um, this uh, is a kind of a kitchen sink program that is trying to tackle this huge problem of 
try, of trying to infer patterns of, of, of transmission and distribution um, in these environmental samples, but it can also, if you have in, in like in environmental samples and clinical samples, but also looking at how the, those, those distribution patterns occur in genes and in mobile genetic elements. Um, and so it's looking for if there's significant evidence of, of lateral gene transfer or combination, and how do you associate these transmission events, for example, with different habitats, with different geographic proximity, there are different phylogenetic related, relatedness or antimicrobial usage. Here's how it, look, here's how it looks. Um, very well, I don't know if this is going to be that brief, but... Um, Here's an overview of it. So it can take your raw sequence trees and it will assemble them with unicycler. This is optional and do some QC for you, similar to the way proxy works. Or you can take your pre-assembled genomes and you can perform a um, specialized annotation for you using RGI, mob suite, which we covered, island path, which we covered, vibrant, which we covered, Bacta, which is the successor to Praca. And it also uses these databases like the um, virulence finder database. Is that right, Finley? VFDB. Yep. Yeah. BACMIT, which is a database of uh, virulence factor. Sorry, not virulence finder. Virulence factor. Virulence finder. Virulence factor database. Thank you. BACMIT, which is a database of um, of bacterial genes that have uh, show resistance, like metal resistance, so they're implicated in um, like uh, uh, antibactericidal and disinfectant resistance. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, yeah. and uh, biocidal things in general, and there's biocidal. a lot of co we see a lot of co selection on plasmids of heavy metal resistance with antibiotic resistance, right. Okay, right. Casey, which is um, that is oh my gosh, so that's carbohydrate associated enzyme database, and uh, so the so different organisms that well, an, an organism that has a profile for metabolizing different carbohydrates can give can imply um, and give you clues about the environment that it may be able to, um, may be viable in. And then Iceberg 2, so Iceberg 2 is a database of integrative and conjugative elements. It's a type of mobile genetic element that is profiled briefly in your additional slides. Okay, so well, once you have your annotation, then it will ass assess the pan genome using Panaroo, and it can do lineage inference using a, a fast clustering algorithm called PopBunk. It will pr output gene order for you. It also will take the, um, it, it will generate phylogeny for you. It uses fast, fast tree and IQ tree to do that. And then at the end, there's the lateral gene transfer coevolution and recombination. We're just trying to infer these patterns of lateral gene transfer, and it uses that using like programs like RSPR, which is that is a rooted uh, subtree prune and reattach algorithm. Won't get into the details of it. Um, Evol CCM is for commu oh God, community coevolution co model that was taking a look at pairs of genes or pairs of mobile genetic elements or genes of mobile genetic elements and tries to figure out if they are co-segregating through the tree, like are they associated in, in, in the tree or do they, do they have presence or absence that is, um, that is kind of random throughout the tree? Is that about right for evil system? Yeah, exactly. It looks at for correlations yeah. between the phylogeny and presence absence patterns of genes. Right. And so this basically gives you an association. So if you see this one, you also see this other one, right? And then Gubbins is for a while well, for whole genome sequence based um, detection of recombination. Okay. All right. Here's an example using Arite or, or, or a, a, a prototype of, of Arite to investigate antimicrobial resistance in a uh, group of about 1,300 Enterococcus faecium genomes. So the so we're looking at, a, at these different components like AMR, genomic islands, phage, plasmids. Um, novel is the ones that weren't detected by, um, by mob suite and virulence factors. And then these colors are showing you these different types of environments, like clinical. Oh, and they're also, um, these are from two disparate geographic locations, so the UK and uh, Alberta. Um, and they're looking, and so we're trying to look at these, um, well, the, the counts per sample basically is this uh, associations that we have for these 
different types of uh, mobile genetic elements or other features like, like virulence factors with different environments, like clinical environment, wastewater. This is um, like downstream wastewater from like near hospitals, um, agricultural, so out on the farm, like natural water environments and agriculture, wastewater. So, and um, so one of the things that are kind of interesting to see here is that for that AMR, so the pink and red, which is the clinical UK and Alberta, um, clinical um, AMR is, is uh, has a higher count here. So AMR is a higher count in clinical and um, uh, um, clinical samples and in wastewater samples um, than it does for other environments. And so that's kind of interesting to see. And there's kind of like this hypothesis here that once an AMR gene makes its way into uh, the, like into, it is distributing throughout the human population. So it's in a clinical environment that it will adapt to that to that host. And uh, so even when we've been transferred zoonotically or environmentally, once it gets into that, that new host, it, well, you can undergo these um, selective sweeps that will um, diversify and, uh, and, and create distance between the ancestors and the ones that are circulating in that um, population. And it also implies that it does that they um, become so adapted to that environment, so in the, so people, for example, that it can't kind of transmit back into other environments like agri like the agriculture environment or, 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 or uh, yeah, like, you know, back, back to the, um, you know, back to streams or into other, um, you know, farms um, back into the environment, basically just circulates within humans. This is an interesting finding. 